be joined by several council members as they come in. But today our committees will be conducting an oversight hearing on the city's services and supports for immigrant businesses and the owners of those businesses. I'm really excited to be co-chairing this hearing because while we've spent a lot of time discussing the impact of the federal administration's anti-immigrant policies, I think it's also incredibly important to celebrate the power of our communities. So much of the discussion that led us to this, uh, both the chair and I really felt it was necessary to really join these conversations as we help support what we think is the backbone of the economy here in the city of New York. In the state of New York, census data shows that immigrants create more than 40% of all new businesses. In New York City, half of all businesses operating in our city are immigrant owned. In 2017, immigrant owned businesses across the country employed 8 million American workers and generated $1.3 trillion in total sales. Here in the city, Immigrant owned businesses employ up to 42% of some neighborhood populations. Excitingly, immigrants across the US are twice as likely to become entrepreneurs as their US born counterparts. And those discussions are happening in our districts. As council members, we get to hear some of those ideas as they come to our district office asking for support, asking to figure out how they can start a business and an idea and grow it from an idea to a full business. All this goes to show that immigrant businesses are the lifeblood of our local economies, of our local neighborhoods, of our communities. And beyond this, immigrant-owned small businesses are anchors within our communities, providing culturally relevant goods, services, and spaces to convene. As we highlight the crucial role immigrant businesses play in our city, it is important not to forget that the many challenges unique to immigrant small business owners um, it is in the city's best interest to make every effort to provide services and support that incubate innovation and new entrepreneurial initiatives by specifically investing in immigrant communities. We will hear from advocates uh, later today about the many challenges they and their constituencies regularly face. Our own, our own research has shown that some of the persistent barriers to success remain. And this isn't going to be new for many of you who come to the immigration hearings, but they are, one, language access. Two, access to capital. Three, access to legal and mediation services, among others. There are many services available to small businesses throughout the, small, uh, the Department of Small Businesses, the state's Department of Labor, and even the federal government. Today's specific focus is on ensuring that existing programs are adequately reaching immigrant small businesses and specifically addressing issues faced by this diverse and sometimes hard to reach constituency. I look forward to the constructive discussion with the mayoral administration about this topic and I want to thank all those who helped us get to this point here today uh, in this committee, committee council uh, Harbani Auja, committee policy analyst Elizabeth Kronk, uh, and my staff, my chief of staff, specifically Lorena Lucero, Legislative Director uh, Cesar Vargas, and Communications Director Tony Chirito, as well as the staff of all the small business, uh, all the staff at the Small Business Committee. I'm going to hand it over to my co-chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, I am equally excited for this uh, joint hearing and looking forward to the facts that are going to be presented and what we hear today so we can come up with a constructive approach. Um, and I value not only as a colleague, but, but the committee that you chair and the importance of that committee in New York City. So thank you again. You. Good afternoon, I'm Council Member Mark Joan, I chair of the Committee on Small Business and I wanna welcome you to our joint hearing with Committee on Immigration, chaired by my friend, Councilman Member Menchaca. Our hearing today focuses on city services and support for immigrant business owners and how we can best protect our immigrant-owned mom-and-pop shops. While immigrants make up only 13% of the United States population, immigrants represent 30% of new entrepreneurs. In 2017, over 3 million immigrants ran their own businesses, accounting for one in every five entrepreneurs in the country. Immigrant business owners generate millions of jobs and bring billions of dollars in revenue, reviving neighborhoods and revitalizing regional economies. 
Immigrant-owned businesses are an integral to the economy and culture of New York City. In addition to making up 45% of the city's workforce, immigrant New Yorkers own around half of New York City's businesses. In some neighborhoods, immigrant-owned businesses employ over 40% of the neighborhood population. Despite immigrant mom and pops, shops being a vital aspect of our city's unique and vibrant culture, small businesses are finding it very difficult to keep their doors open. From the rise of e-commerce to big box store competition and consumer behavior changes, our small businesses are facing more and more hurdles. Micro businesses, mom and pop shops, must also frequently navigate an arcane maze of thousands of rules and regulations as they are set up their businesses. According to a recent report on immigrant-owned businesses by the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, nearly 50% of businesses surveyed ranked tickets, fines, permits, and inspections in their top three concerns. Unfortunately, the first time a small business will hear about a regulation is when they are hit with the fine for violating it. SBS. The State's Department of Labor and SBA all provide important services for small businesses. Educational courses for small business owners are integral to creating a strong and lasting relationship between small businesses and the government. Nonetheless, there are areas where the city must do better to educate small business owners. Not providing services in an immigrant small business owner's native language makes it difficult for them to access or engage with city services. The immigrant community in New York City's entrepreneurial spirit is a reflection of the strength of the American dream. As the chair of the Committee on Small Business, I believe it is necessary to continue to foster this spirit. I look forward to working collaboratively with the administration to ensure that all immigrant-owned businesses in New York City have access to SBS services so they can continue to grow their business and thrive in our city. And quite frankly, we shouldn't continue to talk about our, the importance of small businesses and the immigrant communities and the integral part that they serve in this great city. It's time for action. We really need to view them as a partner, embrace them as a partner, embrace them for the services, the tax base, and the communities that they represent in a more fruitful and transparent and honest manner. I want to thank and recognize the Small Business um, Committee, as well as uh, the Chair of Immigration and his committee, in particular, um, Stephanie and Noah, for their hard work, and my staff and we'll recognize, I guess, the other council members as they make their way to this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And with that said, we want to place this conversation uh, in the midst of the community that's impacted. So we're going to have a public panel first. And we'd like to call up uh, Ah Young uh, Kim from the Asian American Federation uh, to the dais here, and Sabrine Othman, uh, from the Yemeni American Association, the Yeme Yemeni American Merchant Association, and then Louis Lu, uh, 8th Avenue, Sunset Park, business advocate uh, to, uh, to the front as well. If you'd like to start, make sure that the, the red light is on and it's close to you. <laughs> okay. Hello? And then just yeah, bring it closer to you if you can point it towards. <coughs> there you go. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, uh, City Council's Committee on Immigration and Committee on Small Business, and to Chairman Chaka and Jonai for having us here. Um, my name is Ayang Kim. I am a small business project manager at the Asian American Federation. Currently, I manage programs that offer operational and technical support to small businesses and the owners of small businesses on Union Street in Flushing. 
Since 2017, the Federation has worked with over 100 small businesses located along the Union Street corridor in Flushing, Queens, under an EDC grant. Through our Small Business Assistance Program, we serve nearly 100 Asian-owned small businesses in Flushing and have access to a network of over 1,000 uh, entrepreneurs who belong to the Korean American Business Council in New York. We have assisted small business owners who ch face challenges due to language barriers, confusing government regulations, and run programs to address their specific needs. I'd like to take this chance to thank you, Chair uh, Jonai Amanchaka, for your recognition of the difficulties of immigrant small businesses and also the need to give them support through language access, access to capital, as well as legal services. I'm here to talk today to talk about the hardships that Asian small business owners face on the ground. Asians are the fastest growing population in New York City, representing at least 10% in 26, 10% uh, of the population in 26 out of the 51 city council districts. Additionally, Asian-owned businesses are a vibrant and essential part of the city's economy, accounting for about half of net new, uh, uh, net new economic activity and half of net new employment from 22, 2002 to 2012 in New York City. Their contribution to the economy is significant despite the language and cultural barriers they face, and yet there is not enough adequate support for them to communicate with city agencies or participate in civic engagement to have a say in policy changes that they are going to be impacted by directly and sometimes harm or shut down their businesses. Apart from the general slowdown and real economy and high rents and taxes, the most urgent problem that Asian small businesses uh, face on the grounds stems from the lack of information and in-language communication or support from city agencies to help the immigrant small business owners. Many of these owners have limited English proficiency, as you both know, which makes it impossible for them to understand the city policies or regulations. Yet they're left in the dark right now where ill-translated material from the city government failed to properly inform them of their responsibilities, finding themselves inundated with fines that debilitate or shut down their businesses. Thus, many Asian merchants feel frustrated that they're stuck in a catch-22 situation where they keep receiving fines that debilitate their businesses with little room to make corrections for their mistakes and also to learn from their mistakes. Although city agencies do offer services such as visiting inspector programs to educate new entrepreneurs or um, provide DCA's inspection checklists, for example, which are very helpful, they are not really being supported or disseminated with proper language assistance or outreach. And even these documents that are given to them are often wrongly translated and they give wrong information to them. So they also lose trust of like city government um, from the point of the um, small business owners. Also, Asian small business owners are often left out when new policies are being discussed. Actually, no, they're usually left out when new policies are discussed. And we see that as Asian small business, business owners often find out about a change in government policy and regulation after they have been finalized, they have been, there is practically no chance for them to actually engage in government discussions about how it's going to impact them or how they can actually deal with a new regulation. For example, the Korean Dry Cleaners Association worries that most of their members may go out of business because of the PERC regulation that is going to kick in next year. The, the Korean Grocers Association is still trying to find out how they're going to deal with the rising operational costs because of the styrofoam and plastic bag ban. These, we're not saying that these policies are bad, but they have to be discussed in beforehand, and there really is no outreach to people who don't speak or understand English. Through the relationships that we built up in our, uh, through our Flushing office, it r enables us to organize and activate the small business community quickly when challenges arise. We understand how Asian small businesses organize themselves as well as their chain of communication, which should be fully utilized by the city government as well to disseminate information that are crucial and that are necessary for people to actually adhere to the law and not get in trouble. Our merchants rely on us for in-language operational, uh, operational and technical assistance, and many of the merchants come to us before contacting city agencies um, in times of trouble because of the trust that we have built with the community over time. To adequate, adequately support the small businesses that contribute to New York City's economic engine, we asked the city council to make an initial investment of $1 million to provide immigrant small businesses with the in-language technical support they need to thrive in New York City. 
With this funding, AAF uh, plans to maintain and expand our small business program to serve Asian small businesses in Queens in the neighborhoods where support is most needed and where they do not get that kind of support or communication, uh, such as Flushing or Murray Hill, Bayside onwards. We would establish with this fund an Asian small business center to be an information center and a constant presence on the ground to provide daily operational assistance. Such presence is absolutely necessary to gain trust and build a working relationship with Asian small businesses, which is challenging for a government entity because small business owners often hesitate to reach out to a city entity in times of need. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Oh, sorry, it's close. Oh. All right. uh, I'm Sabrina Othman. I'm the advocacy director at the, uh, director at the Yemeni American Merchant Association. Um, the Yemeni Mer American Merchant Association, or also known as YAMA, is a grassroots nonprofit that was established after the very successful bodega strike in 2017, a merchant organized protest against the Muslim ban. We at YAMA are pleased to provide testimony on behalf of our merchants on the topic of oversight, city services, and support for immigrant business owners. We would like to thank the City Council Committee on Small Businesses and, uh, and Committee on Immigration for giving immigrant small business owners and organizations that serve them, like ours, the opportunity to speak and voice our opinions on, this, on the city's services for immigrant business owners. As an association that represents th thousands of Yemeni American merchant merchants in the uh, New York City area, we are proud to, to say that we are dedicated to educating elevating and advocating for our community. Unfortunately, our community has experienced neglect from the Small Business Services Department. The, the language barrier has made our merchants feel out of place in their own city. Some SBS crucial material are not accommodating to Arabic speakers. The association, I'm sorry, the, the translation uh, staff is poorly trained and on-site translation is not available most of the time. Our experience with trying to, to access services from SBS resources for our community in the past year has been difficult, to say the least. Our organization has reached out to, to try to set up trainings in Arabic for almost a, a year now, and we haven't been successful. During the past year, our organization has partnered with council members Justin Brannon and Rafael Espinal to um, success, successfully pass legislations like the Owning Act, which helped our merchants eliminate crippling fines for permits they never knew they, uh, they, uh, they never knew existed due to the lack of accommodating translation, uh, translation services for Arabic speaking merchants. And an issue we encountered after the Owning Act was, success, uh, uh, was successfully passed through the city council was the Department of Buildings refusal to acknowledge the new legislation. Our merchants have struggled with this consistently and, they, uh, and the help they were told they would receive and the help they actually received have been contradictory. We have, we have had the uh, Department of Buildings employees tell our employees to come to DOB uh, to translate for their uh, own merchants. We, also, we are also disappointed with the council's recent decision on banning e-cigarettes uh, vaping products. Although Yama has supported the ban on flavor to safeguard our children, we asked the council to keep immigrant-owned businesses in consideration. We requested that before you make final decisions, you make sure you, you find policy that would not put immigrant-owned businesses out of, the, out of business. We feel that the council has not done its job by communicating with uh, stakeholders and making sure they're at the decision table as not to cripple their businesses. We believe that your recent policies have not taken our black and brown communities into consideration, and we implore you to consider our communities when discussing <coughs> matters such as these. We invite, you, uh, we invite you all to work with us at any time for any am amicable resolution. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Liu, make sure that the light is on. Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you to the city council for this excellent opportunity for us uh, small business owners to let us give our voices. 我的名字叫路易路, 我是来自于, 
My name is Louis Lu. I'm a small business owner from Sunset Park, 8th Avenue. I know that the mark of many successful immigrant business owners is a professional ethic built on vision, dedication, and perseverance. 无论我们是经营露天酒店、商店，还是从事技术制造、设计、食品或者时尚领域。no matter what field we operate in, whether that be in open air shops or in technology, design, food, or fashion. 移民企业主，我们不但面临独特的挑战，我们还包括没有足够的社区资源。immigrant business owners, we not only face unique challenges, but also lack enough community resources. One of the most challenging aspects of opening and developing a business is to acquire capital. This applies to almost all businesses. 许多移民企业主，我们面临的挑战和很多小型企业在社区中的提差挑战都是一样的。The other challenges faced by many immigrant business owners are the same that are faced by neighborhood small businesses. 比如说信用不足或者缺乏跟银行业务之间的关系的支持等等。for example, not having enough credit history or deficient in banking, business relations, and etc. In addition, many city, state, and federal laws and regulations in some areas pose barriers to immigrant business owners. 移民企业主，我们通常不能够了解所有法律法规的合法性。As immigrant business owners, we frequently do not understand all the legality of all the laws and regulations. 有某些纽约市的法规也不能支持和协助我们的企业发展。Some New York City regulations also do not assist or support our businesses. 就好像2018年。在商业招牌这一方面，我们就存在着很大的争议性。In For example, in 19, interpret a mistake. In 2018, there was a big controversy surrounding business signage. 有很多我们的小型企业主都受到了影响。Many um, of our immigrant businesses owners were affected. 我们被罚款。我们成了不应该被加这个罚款成为我们不应该加重的负担 We were fined, and this fine became an extra added burden that should not have been 所以我督促我们纽约市议会跟纽约市政府能够扩大对社区的文化法规方面的宣传推广 Therefore, I urge New York City government and the city council to expand within communities the promotion of cultural awareness and also legal awareness. And finally, to really help immigrant small businesses to expand their businesses. Thank you. Thank you to the panel. Uh, I think you really outlined a real collective response to the need for conversation with small businesses, immigrant businesses around regulations. I think that was a pretty major theme across the board, and then access to capital. Um, I'm going to have a couple questions. I'm going to hand it over to the chair. We were also joined by Councilmember Drum and Councilmember Matthew Jean uh, from the Immigration Committee. And my first question is, and maybe it's to uh, Mr. Louis Lu from 8th Avenue and Sunset Park, where have you found, where um, in your experience as a small business and other small businesses, have you found access to capital today? Where, where can you go today 
um, since you since you talked about it being a, a, a hardship for access. Uh,你先生,第一个问题,我问一下你,那这个呢,是在你的经验中,作为一个小型的业主,那你在资金方面,你是今天来讲,在什么地方,呃,你因为有经历过这些磨难,请告诉我,你的资金来源在今天的话,
because we don't have a structural, you know, consolidated information or a system to actually deal with <coughs> merchants before the problems arise. I think giving proper in-language assistance and in-language material that will prevent a lot of these regulation issues and inform small merchants of what their responsibilities are and how to avoid violations and how to deal with it when they need to, that is the kind of support and service they need right now, and that is not really something that they can ask the city government to do. Thank you for that analysis, that understanding, and the, the kind of need that you're seeing uh, within just your purview of your work mm -hmm. and, and really making that connection as a way towards the city agency, but a stop through you, a trusted partner on the ground. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Chair Jonai. Thank you, Chairman Chaka. So I'm curious, um, I am also uh, the byproduct of an immigrant small business, so um, this is personal and passionate for me. It's my finding and my experience on the ground with my own community that they do not view government as a partner. They actually view government as a threat. And there is no communication between government and small businesses, and I'm curious, you represent three different ethnicities. You find the same, respectively, of your, the organization and the groups of small businesses that you interact with. And we can just go across. I'm sorry, what's the question? Do you find the same response from your community and your, the businesses that you interact with? Yes. That they fear government. Yes. They don't see government as a partner. Uh, if I may say so, I would say it's not only fear, but there's also a lot of animosity against the government because being lost inside uh, amidst all these complex regulations where they don't understand and nobody explains them what they are and they end up getting all these fines for that they have to shut down the business because of. A lot of our merchants actually tell me, like, quote, I feel like the government is after us for quick money. I feel like the government is trying to make, you know, easy revenue. Like, why, are, why is a violation for a small sign thousands of dollars unless they're trying to make money out of us? And I feel like it's unfair. Just to, like, give one, one example of somebody. Um, and, yeah, like, they, if they didn't feel that kind of fear, they would come to you and ask for help. So please continue with the same questioning. And then I, I just want to elaborate. And I don't want to put words into your mouth, but I want to make sure that we express ourselves. It has been my understanding and my experience that small business owners are even afraid to complain for fear of repercussions, that if you own a restaurant, the next day, Department of Health will be visiting your establishment uh, and doing a um, inspection. Do you find this type of overall, and I say, and again, I'm want to be very careful that I'm not directing you, but I want you to feel f comfortable on speaking and advocating for your communities, respectively. And this is that time that you can do so. Um, yeah, so a lot like uh, she was saying, uh, we've experienced the same thing with the language barriers and stuff like that. It's, not it's also uh, kind of like the mistrust between uh, government and small business owners, but uh, I think one of the main issues is I, uh, government agencies, like uh, attitude towards our business owners, they've never really kind of made them feel like they were a part of the decision table. They've never kind of reached out to them or um, our community has like a lot, like you were saying, actually a lot of our experiences are a lot like uh, the Asian American Federation's experience. Um, we've experienced an alienation. Uh, uh, the, our, our merchants don't feel a part of the community because of the language barrier. Even when there are some materials that are uh, accommodating to our merchants, they're not sufficient. They haven't been sufficient. Our, our merchants have also dealt with a lot. Like I said, we've, we've collaborated with uh, uh, council mem uh, com members, Justin Brandon and uh, Espina, uh, Rafael Espinal, um, on the Owning Act, and even when that was passed, when even when they voiced their opinions on that, they felt uh, an alienation. And even though this was passed, this was this went through the de the Department of Buildings did not, you know, cooperate with that. So again, it's like an issue of mistrust 
alienation, um, lack of communication. Like they just don't feel a part of the, the community. They don't feel a part of. The, they don't. They probably don't even like know about the, the committee for small businesses and immigration, and that they, that you guys actually care. They don't. They don't know this. So there's there's a lot a lot of that a lack of like communication. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question for me? <laughs> Along the same line, so maybe you can translate the question as the experience on the ground and the, the level of confidence and trust between small businesses and government. Do they view government as a partner or a threat? Do they fear government? Uh,那您这个作为一个小企业者,您会不会感到跟政府有这个冲突感,对政府的话会有这个对敌意吗,会有害怕吗? Uh, but when government agencies would come to small businesses to do inspections or come to us, their attitude, as this lady has said, is very poor. Because when they communicate with us, it's just directly um, very harsh. You could do this, or you cannot do that. So I have a suggestion. We can we can, we feel right? So as we all know, education is very important. We can we can, the government can, we can, we can, because the government, because the inspectors are the first line of people who have direct, who directly interact with us. So if we could change the way that they could speak, the way that they communicate, this um, education could start with that. Now, 這樣子的話,我們在工作過程當中又可以學到法律正確的法律法規。So in working with them we're able to acquire the um the legality as it is. 而且通過面對面的溝通,我們會很快的接受改正認識到法律法規。and through this kind of face-to-face -face encounter, we're able to understand, we're able to adjust, and we're able to know what the laws and regulations are. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I've had my own experiences in my own private life before coming to government, so I know exactly what you mean when you say the way you're spoken to. The way you're approached, uh, the manner, um, and it feels more like an attack and um, a source of income for the city versus let me embrace you for the tax base that you are, the employer that you are, the services that you provide, and let's work on this together. It's reprimanding. Um, it's a reprimand and it's you're going to learn by paying fines you're not, we're not going to educate you we're going to teach you through the penalties that you pay and my last question for all three of you when it comes to capital and I understand your response that it's normally done through family and friends and community. But there was also non-conventional methods of borrowing money, so the institutions don't, that currently exist don't cater to ethnic-based communities. 
And oftentimes, those ethnicities are targeted and taken advantage of by community members that charge extremely high interest rates. Has this been your experience as well? Yes. Yes, you know, these um, unconventional ways of loans have really high interest rates, sometimes 15%, sometimes 16%, and they carry very high risks with them. Because these loans are carried out between people and there are no other collateral. So a lot of times the loans that we have um, got into agreements with, we're not able to get the loans. And so that leads to tensions within relationship, and that in turn spreads throughout into the community. Thank you. Did you want to respond to uh, that question? And I know that your organization is a little differently. Um, yeah. Your community doesn't charge any interest. Um, yes, uh, right. interest is very, uh, it's kind of like a taboo to right. a lot of our members. So I don't, I don't think that's an issue we've dealt with. So I'll just pass it on. Thank you. I wish I could say the same, but yes, I must say uh, unconventional loans are an issue. Um, it's not only an issue in the sense that like it's a high interest rate, but also the fact that there is no system of protecting the lenders and or the people that have vouched for the lenders. Um, also in the sense that these unconventional loans rely on social network and personal relationships. When a business goes wrong and these loans are also defunct, a lot of the times like it's not only the owner of that business, but their family and friends that also get sucked into the trouble like in the chain reaction. I want to thank you for your honesty, um, and you truly are, in my eyes and in the eyes of many, a tremendous asset for this city. And I value you, and so does my colleague, uh, Chairman Machaka. So thank you for being here and making the time to speak for so many that aren't able to speak <coughs> for themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Jonai. Uh, and stay, because the administration will be testifying next, and hopefully, uh, kind of giving some uh, understandings of what we can do together as we work towards solving these problems. Thank you so much. You. We're going to be calling up the administration next, uh, and we have uh, Commissioner Greg Bishop, New York City Department of Small Businesses, and uh, Sonia Lin from the New York, New York City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you so much for uh, being here with the, the first public panel uh, really what, and I know we are uh, pressed for time, and so if there's a way that we can do a summary of the report and really begin, I think, at the crux of what we think the major issues are here in terms of relationship, mistrust, addressing some of the issues around capital, and then we can kind of go from there as much as we can. This is an ongoing conversation. We're going to keep, we're going to keep working together to address some of these issues, but we want to, we want to really address the panel's uh, uh, kind of top line issues uh, for this panel today. Sure. Um, <clears throat> um, if oh, I could just, just administer the oath really quickly, if you could raise your right hand, please. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, just wanted to clarify, do you want me to, to read the testimony? Yeah, for time's or? sake, uh, if, yep. there's, if there's a way that you can summarize your, okay. your remarks, and then yep. we want to get to some of, the, some of the issues that were brought up during the first panel. Sure. Um, so it, it, it's actually pretty helpful um, uh, for me to hear some of the concerns. A lot of um, what we do at Small Business Services, as you know, 
uh, is to help um, businesses start, expand, and operate. Uh, but uh, Im immigrant-owned businesses, as you stated, are the the economic engine of the of New York City. Uh, over uh, half of the uh, the small businesses in New York City are owned by immigrant entrepreneurs. So it's important for us as an agency uh, to do do as much as possible uh, to reach out to those communities. Mm -hmm. In my testimony, I talked about a lot about the work that we've done. Uh, I especially talked about outreach, and I'll be happy to expound upon that because I think, as you heard, um, one of the challenges that we do have, um, and I totally agree, is that we are government, um, and there is a perception uh, that government uh, could either be uh, not helpful or punitive, um, and that is um, one of the things that we are trying to eliminate. And working with council and working with partners is probably the only way we can do that. Um, because if we uh, can uh, demonstrate to our partners um, that we do have and um, the services that's available, uh, we do want to be helpful to that community, um, we then develop that trust. Uh, we started some of that through uh, working with consulates uh, because they are trusted. Uh, we work with a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations um, and we are employing a model uh, almost like train the trainer, um, and we could talk a little bit about more about how we were being, how we were able to innovate that through a grant that we got for city community development, um, and how we deployed that within uh, our services and our delivery of services. Our recent uh, relaunch of our uh, courses, our online courses, uh, was to address the fact that we had courses that we did not have language capabilities. Uh, so we are now expanding those capabilities by being able to provide courses online in different languages. Arabic is one of them uh, to address the concern you just heard. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that we did not have the ability to print out, for example, um, uh, materials. Uh, but as you said, it's an ongoing, um, um, you know, for us, uh, we want to make sure that we continue to do as much as possible. We are not saying that we are doing um, you know, everything that needs to be done. There, obviously, there's more to do. Um, and I think particularly, um, you know, the last thing I would say is that um, you know, the, getting to immigrant entrepreneurs uh, before they even start thinking about doing or uh, starting a business, uh, immigrant entrepreneurs face additional challenges, uh, the language barrier, uh, for the um, non-English speaking immigrant entrepreneurs, um, uh, they tend to be preyed upon more. Uh, so you heard in terms of mm -hmm. um, access to capital, um, uh, you know, in terms of even unscrupulous uh, quote unquote expediters. Uh, there's a whole, um, you know, uh, community out there that targets immigrant entrepreneurs, or the immigrant community in general, mm -hmm. and immigrant entrepreneurs are part of that. Uh, so working with our partners at Moya, um, we are trying to get ahead of that. Uh, the last thing I would say, obviously, this is personal to me. I'm an immigrant. Uh, my grandmother um, was a vendor, um, and and she, um, you know, built um, an an opportunity because she was an entrepreneur. Uh, she was able to create an opportunity for my mom to come to this country, uh, mm -hmm. and then my mom sent for me. Um, so I have and and share the same sort of immigrant story that we all have. Um, so be happy to to take your questions uh, because I know. We want to get into the meat of it, um, but this the work that we do at SBS is not just for entrepreneurs. Uh, we do a lot on the workforce side as well, uh, but the focus has been, and since I've been commissioner, has been in terms of how do we look at our services through an equitable lens, uh, and in particular, how do we focus on helping immigrant, the immigrant community, whether it's entrepreneurs or, or workforce. Uh, so with that, I will you know um, submit the um, the written testimony for you to, to read for the record. Um, but uh, I just want you to know that this is a top priority for the agency. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Moya, do you have a prepared statement? We don't have prepared testimony, yeah. but happy to answer questions. Wonderful. Thank you. And I think what I can do is start with a few questions for Moya, and then we'll just go back and forth. Um, we, we, you know, we've been working uh, deeply with many concerns in our immigrant community. The focus here for small businesses is, is a, I think, an important one and often gets um, overshadowed in so many ways. Immigrant businesses just make magic happen every single day, uh, whether they're a street vendor on the streets of our communities or a, a kind of growing brick and mortar. They're just figuring it out. Mm -hmm. And when they can't, they close. And they often, in silence, just 
kind of disappear. And, and we know that, and we, we get to hear a lot of those stories, you get to hear a lot of those stories. What we really wanna know is how the coordination between Moya and the work that you're doing on language access and immigration, legal services, all those kind of daily things connect on a consistent basis with SBS. And where, where does that connection happen? Um, how is it happening? How often is it happening? We kind of want to get a sense of the, of the, of the coordination. Yeah. Can you speak to that? So I, I think it starts at the very top. Um, and, and literally, we've had a longstanding relationship with Moya. Uh, our guide for immigrant entrepreneurs was uh, developed in partnership with Moya. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we understood, um, we produced a guide that not only taught, um, covered all the different challenges um, and addressed the different challenges uh, that immigrant entrepreneurs would face, but then we also wanted to make sure that immigrant on entrepreneurs knew their rights um, and all the resources that's available to them that was not even related to entrepreneurship. Um, uh, so we partnered with Moya um, with that. Uh, it is an ongoing relationship. Uh, Moya has a number of events around the city that we're always invited to and we participate. Um, you know, we have done uh, joint workshops together. Um, we've done joint outreach events together um, because it is part of our DNA at SBS in terms of figuring out how can we use trusted partners and Moya is seen as a trusted partner in the immigrant community. Uh, so uh, as part of our strategy, in order to, and I would say infiltrate, but in order to build that trust, we have to work with uh, not only a city agency that has uh, the relationship, uh, but then Moya then connects us to partners as well uh, and introduces us to partners that we may not have thought about. Um, you know, one of the things that I just wanted to highlight, uh, one of the learnings from the uh, Immigrant Business Initiative uh, was we developed a partnership with uh, the Shorefront Y. Uh, they are in the, the, um, uh, the Russian community and they deal a lot with housing, et cetera, but they had no idea about anything with economic development um, and entrepreneurship. And because we were able to build, build that relationship, they are now equipped uh, to, if someone is coming in for an unrelated matter, to then connect them, because usually uh, someone is going for another service and then you could connect the dots. Um, so that is you know, um, a number of ways that we work together. And yeah, I think um, our partnership with SBS has been very strong throughout my time at Moya since 2014. I've worked with SBS in various ways on programs, um, with respect to outreach, language access, um, you know, all the things that the commissioner just listed. Um, SBS is part of our interagency task force, which convenes regularly, as you know, um, to speak to immigration issues and issues affecting immigrants throughout the city. Um, and we work with them um, particularly closely, as the commissioner noted, on outreach, um, partnering uh, both SBS events, Moya events, um, kind of multi-agency and community events to make sure that immigrant communities around the city know about city services and resources, really see a face, identify agencies and how they might access help. As we've heard, um, that's one of the biggest challenges facing immigrant immigrant communities on a number of fronts um, right now. And so that's really a priority for Moya. Um, and SBS has been a fantastic partner in participating in our resource fairs, in town halls that we've convened around the city, um, and in other events, um, you know, both ways. We go and table at their events, they come to our events. Um, language access as well. Um, as you know, every agency has a language access coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, Moya has a dedicated language access and language services team that works with city agencies across um, the government um, and shares best practices, guidance, um, offers technical assistance when appropriate, um, you know, supplements uh, language services as well. Um, and that's a really fruitful and strong relationship that we've been very pleased to work with SBS on. Um, and then, um, as the commissioner alluded to, um, you know, this is a a very challenging time for immigrant communities throughout the city. Um, just the pace of developments at the federal level, the level of fear and confusion. And so that's an area of expertise that Moya has and brings to our relationship um, with SBS as well, because you know the fears are not uh, localized in any, any particular place. They affect workplaces yeah. um, as well. I mean, a great example, uh, two, two great examples. Uh, one, we worked with Moya uh, to work with uh, the U.S. Social Security Administration, uh, because there's a lot of no match letters going out. There was fear and confusion in the small business community, but it was also affecting 
uh, immigrant workers. Um, so we worked together on a strategy and um, we had a very positive income uh, outcome. And I think uh, Moy is still pushing and, and rightfully so to make sure that um, we hold our federal partners uh, more accountable. Um, another example is, um, you know, I did a, a corridor tour up in the Bronx and I stepped into a supermarket and one of the business and one of the, the um, the owners mentioned that he saw a sharp decline um, in the use of uh, SNAP um, uh, in terms of people coming in to, to buy products. And that was clearly a result of the, um, the recent public charge. Conf um, you know, no, so we've, we're working with Moya to make sure that we get Moya up there to clear the air in terms of things. So we work very closely together as we get intel um, on both sides of it. Does Moya receive specific complaints on small business concerns with small business owners? Um, from time to time, um, we have a constituent services team. We have outreach team that is out there engaging with community partners, community leaders throughout the city. Um, and so, you know, of course, we hear about um, developments that impact business owners. Um, definitely, we heard a lot from um, sort of partners that we work with about the um, the sort of signage issues from last year. Um, we uh, put together um, an event um, in Brooklyn to bring city agencies out to have more information sharing and awareness um, and support on this issue. Um, and so we try to be um, responsive and connect to the right agency partners when we're hearing about these concerns from um, business owners and other constituents. And, and, and really what I'd like to kind of see and hear about is the way that you feel the, the questions and the concerns and the complaints. Um, record them in terms of the kind of flow of business issues that are coming in. Maybe Action NYC is getting them. Uh, you said you have a constituent case line. Mm -hmm. And and kind of want to get a sense about, about how big the issue for small businesses are within the, the kind of Moya face, the, the Moya facing interactions. Are those recorded? Do you have a sense of understanding about how, how, how big the issue is for businesses? Um, I think that um, business owners will come to us about specific issues. I think that's mostly how it arises. And generally, I think how we hear about them is through our external affairs work, mm -hmm. through the um, outreach that we do, um, through the commissioners um, kind of work with community leaders throughout the city, um, including through um, work with community partners on programs like IDNYC and Action NYC. Um, and um, through our constituent services line as well. And so it's through these engagements and interactions that we'll hear about particular barriers um, that these partners will raise to our attention, um, such as uh, the signage issue, such as um, the receipt of these no match letters from the Social Security Administration, which has caused so much confusion this year. Um, and so you know, generally what we do is we try to understand the issue, we try to understand um, you know, who are the right partners to work with in the administration um, and to develop a plan to um, you know, be responsive to the questions and concerns that we're hearing, whether it's providing more information and clarity about what's happening, if that's really the need, um, or addressing if there's the specific need or challenges, language access, or um, you know, being connected to help. Um, you know, it, it sort of depends on the issue, but that's, yeah, that's how we tend to approach it. Sorry to interrupt, and I'm also looking at time, and I want to make sure I give Chair uh, Joe and I half the time, and I'm kind of half through my time. The 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 question is is more about like understanding through data and trends, and whether or not you you're kind of collecting that data so that it, it's like aggregate and understanding a, a sense of per, uh, percentage and how big this is, issue is, what kind of complaints are coming in that kind of stuff. Is that something that you are uh, reporting on? Well, we can, absolutely. Um, so as you know, we have um, a research unit um, within Moya that <laughs> looks at um, the American Community Survey data um, and works with the um, New York City Opportunity to sort of analyze that data and understand, um, you know, what is our immigrant business owner community, what are the demographics yeah. of that community, understanding better what the challenges are. Um, and then when there is data available um, that speaks to barriers and challenges facing um, our immigrant business owners or business owners generally on issues that relate to immigrants, we try to get that data um, and, um, and, and share it so that there's wider understanding. Got it. So we'll follow up on the data piece. I think a lot of the work that we did 
uh, as the staff kind of did to pull this thing together, uh, there was a real dearth of information out there that's just knowledgeable or, or accessible. Mm -hmm. So if it does exist, it'd be like to kind of see it so we can help work with you to figure out where, where the trends are uh, and how they relate to some of the stuff that we're getting at our council or district offices as that well. sounds great. Um, according to the 2019 Language Access Implementation Report, SPS reports receiving zero complaints concerning language access and zero requests for additional language access. How does Moya interpret that data? I think, um, sorry, you're speaking to the um, language access report from last year? Yeah. Um, so I think that um, it, it is what it is. Um, I think that um, you know we are still working with all of our agency partners um, and with our community partners and constituents um, to further strengthen language access across the city. Um, there is a piece of um, sort of outreach and awareness building um, that we will continue to do and we recognize it's important to do so that New Yorkers um, with limited English proficiency know that they can ask for um, language services and that those should be available to them, um, that they are um, assured that under local law, um, and that um, they're aware of what mechanisms exist um, should they have trouble accessing, um, accessing language assistance. I think what, what we're seeing from the first panel is this, this kind of divide, and even when they know there's resources, they don't, they don't make that leap. And so many of the times in this immigration committee hearing space, we just find that there's, there's a law that says you can do this, and it just doesn't translate to actual action and bridge building within communities that are in need of those services. And so we're trying to figure out what that, what that new, uh, you know, biological, or not biological, but like an ecosystem that needs to exist. Um, you've heard from the Federation that they'd like to have a million dollars to create a hub. Mm -hmm. That's an example. That's different from what you've just kind of laid out and, and what Moya keeps laying out in terms of their, their approaches, including in 2018, Garifuna and Central American Town Hall uh, was launched in partnership with several agencies, including SBS. And what was the result of that town hall and did that really um, give SBS a role, a specific role? And what has changed in the relationship with that community as a result of that town hall? Because that's, that's something that's different. It's one thing to kind of be tabling, but when you have a town hall, you kind of bring people together, work, it's, it looked really dynamic in a lot of ways. Yeah. Did that change the relationship with the community? So for sure, it, it, um, I think one of the things that we have been doing is using data uh, to figure out uh, where we deploy our, our limited resources. So for example, uh, in Chinatown in the Lower East Side, where you have a huge, a large amount of um, uh, uh, immigrant populations, we saw an increase, well, we saw a large amount of fines uh, for small businesses there, so we decided that we needed to be more surgical. Uh, so we worked with Council Member Chin and the local organizations, uh, not only to do uh, a specific um, event for food establishments, because those, those were the ones, and, and I think you heard it here, um, you, know, you know, I am not happy to hear a business owner saying that a, a an inspector did not treat them um, with courtesy. Uh, that is one of the things that we've talked about. Uh, we've talked to our, our, our other agencies. Uh, we've, as part of Small Business First, uh, uh, customer service training was high on the list because I hear from business owners. Um, so, you know, there's more work to be done there, um, but we wanted to make sure that we were using data to make sure that we target immigrant communities. Uh, that we saw um, a large number of fines because that translated to us that either they did not, they weren't aware of our services, or they might be a language issue. Um, so I will say that that you know, uh, we have tried um, different innovative ways to connect to communities. Uh, in Flushing, for example, uh, because you know we do a lot of social media uh, work in emails and so and uh, uh, Twitter, it's, uh, Instagram. But in the Asian community, WeChat is very prevalent. As you know, uh, when the signage issue was happening, a lot of the information was disseminated through WeChat. 
because we're government and because of WeChat, we're not allowed to have a presence there, uh, but there are partners that we work with that do have a presence. Uh, so we have used their access to WeChat to disseminate information about our services. Uh, in the Korean community, the Korean radio, for example, um, is seen as a trusted source. So I've been on Korean radio. So we have figured out different innovative ways for us to um, reach out to those communities, and a lot of it came from um, you know, the town hall that, that we had. And I would just say specifically, um, you know, I think uh, the partnerships that we have um, going into these town halls, they are enriched and nurtured through the town halls, through these events that bring the community together, bring city agencies together out into the community, and it just, it strengthens the relationship so that when there are issues, when there are needs, whether it's a, a bigger issue or individual constituent requests, they know who to come to, right? They may come to Moya, they may come to SBS, um, depending on what the issue is. So, um, for example, with the Garufina Town Hall, we have strong relationships now with the um, Garufina Community Services. They, they know who to pick up the phone and call or to text um, when their um, members face challenges. Um, and then going back to the question about language access and language access complaints, I mean, I think that those numbers don't really tell the whole story, right? Um, so, um, you know, sure, there needs to be sort of more awareness about what your rights are, um, and that's something that, um, you know, we continue to think about. But at the same time, you know, um, I think the city has made great strides um, in having contracts in place for language access, for um, in telephonic interpretation, um, for translation of written materials, um, and the agencies are working very hard on getting those translations of their most commonly distributed documents into the languages. Um, it's a process, um, and um, you know, Moya has been working closely with our agency partners on that process. Um, but um, you know, there is again, there, I think there's been a lot of progress made on this front. Um, no, no doubt, there's there's progress, and, and we're continuing to ensure that we kind of get towards that. Uh, where where I found it really interesting in terms of the translation that is happening uh, was ill-translated, and that happens a lot, and, and I, I struggle with that too, to be honest, in the city council office, our district office, and the PB, and the stuff that we're trying to do, and, and really trying to figure out what our relationship is to all of you in terms of the administration. Where does language access um, then responsibility to translate effectively happen? Like, who holds that? Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it seems like it dissipates over, over space and time of the city agencies. And, and it's just hit or miss. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'd like to kind of hear from you, both of you about how, how we're gonna attack that because it's not enough just to do it, it you gotta do it right. And we, we turn people off uh, and don't always have the time to go back and rebuild that relationship. I, I would say that um, you know, uh, for us, and, 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 I, and when I said it, um, it is ingrained in our DNA. Uh, when we think about launching programs, we're not thinking about just the program, we're thinking about how we're gonna reach immigrant communities. Uh, so a perfect example is when we launched our commercial lease assistance program, we knew uh, that we had to connect to immigrant communities because they were the most vulnerable in terms of being taken advantage of, of not getting a fair lease or uh, et cetera. Um, and looking at the, the, the outreach plan that we had and how we were able to work with partners, you know, over 60% over, uh, of the more than 600 businesses uh, that took advantage of our program were immigrant owned. Um, so, I th you know, we have um, every aspect of our, our um, service delivery. We look at how we can connect uh, to immigrant entrepreneurs. I will tell you, even when we do MWB events, we have translators, uh, we have translated services. That, that's just part of the run of show, uh, that we will, if we're in a community, we will have translators there. Um, I think, you know, based on my experience, I will tell you, because I've been there, uh, when we have, and we, you know, over, um, our, at the staff at SPS speaks over 31 languages. Um, and in some cases, we detail those staff to come at one of the events that we're doing. Um, and what I see is that even though translation services is available, certain communities feel more comfortable talking to someone who speaks their language um, and, and, and represents government. Uh, and I think that's the, the clarity there. Um, you know, working through a translator, and while we do have that, uh, but it's so important, and that's part of our recruitment process. Uh, when we are hiring staff at SBS, whether they are working on the field or they're working inside uh, the agency, 
language uh, proficiency is part of what we look at. Um, and we look at areas where we don't have language proficiency and we prioritize that. Um, so it's important that our outreach team, that we have individuals that speak at least, you know, the top five, the top ten languages, uh, and we continue to work on that um, as we look at how we recruit employees. Um, because we see a better response when it's someone that says, I'm from the government, I speak your language, and this is what um, we will do to help you. I mean, we saw it when we were out in Sunset Park um, dealing with the signage issue. Um, my outreach person who was speaking uh, Mandarin, uh, you know, I was there, but no one was paying attention to me, right? They were talking to him because there was that trust. Um, and that is something uh, that we em at embody at SBS as we do our outreach and I think uh, our recruitment. And I think that is, you know, one of the things when you talk about different agencies, I've seen a concerted effort that agencies are sensitive uh, to the language um, capabilities um, and needs of different communities and they try to either send staff that can speak the native language or um, at least have some type of translating services. So I think you know it has to start from, from the very top uh, and be integrated in everything that, that not only we do at SBS but the, that the city does. I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Chair Jonai. If there's any extra time, I'll ask a few other questions. Sure. Thank you, Chairman. I don't know if there's gonna be a, <laughs> we may go into overtime. Um, I wanna thank both of you uh, for testifying here today. And um, I guess a basic question. Were you surprised to hear the earlier panel on the issues that they brought up? On any of the issues that were brought up? No. Moya? No. And the question is, what do we do and about it? What could we do? And I know that we strive and we um, often say we could do more. But this is going on now for some time. This is not a unique scenario, a unique argument. Um, and I, I, if anything, I hope the one thing that you walk away with today is that small businesses see government as an enemy, not as a partner, not as a friend, not as someone that values what they offer and what they do for this city, but more of a threat than anything else. And I don't know if anyone you can. So I would say, Council Member, um, you know, when we have partners who can demonstrate that government is not the enemy, uh, we're able to change uh, that perception. Uh, but I was not surprised um, that, you know, some of the uh, feedback that the organizations got from businesses that, um, you know, they don't see government as um, uh, being helpful. Um, I would have really wanted to ask more questions of the gentleman uh, to find out why he did not um, uh, use uh, services from the city. Uh, because I think, you know, and I've always uh, talked about this, as government we need to listen. Um, and the only way we can solve a problem is if we talk to our constituents, uh, the people that we need to help. Um, and being able to ask uh, you know, someone who is our target constituent uh, why you're not using our services will be able to address that issue. Um, you know, I, talk, I think about our entry into Washington Heights. Um, when we opened up our Business Solutions Center there, um, access to capital we know all small businesses struggle with. Uh, but the first year, we only did about $10,000. Um, and the question was, well, we have all these lenders who can connect you to cheaper capital. Uh, why are, is the community still going through the um, non-traditional way of, of getting capital? Um, and there was, one, a trust issue. Um, and the fact that we were able to build throughout the community um, an understanding of what we were providing and demonstrate the fact that we were actually here to help, the following fiscal year, that number went up to $400,000 uh, in terms of capital to uh, businesses in Washington Heights. Um, and it continues to maintain at that level. Um, and that just demonstrates the fact that, you know, we cannot do it by ourselves. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, it is a collective effort. Um, us working with you, uh, with Council Member Manchaka, with the entire uh, committee, uh, with Moya, uh, with our consulates, um, and even with the partners that were here. 
um, you know, to work with them to, to figure out ways uh, that we can be better partners. Um, we have, we've done a lot of train the trainers. Um, we have done in a limited fashion uh, through our neighborhood development um, division. Uh, we've looked to place, uh, for example, fellows um, in uh, organizations to build their capacity uh, to help them to do more outreach. Um, we've figured out um, and we've created opportunities for those organizations to apply for grants. Um, so we want to make sure that we do as much as possible um, to reach those communities through our partners. Um, and you know, I will always say that um, we are open uh, to suggestions, um, but to really and truly working with the immigrant community, um, we need to listen more uh, to figure out how we can actually adjust our services to uh, meet their needs. Well, thank you for saying that. So I'm going to use a perfect example. You heard one of the complaints by all three was the signage law. How long did it take for this administration, after how many businesses were destroyed, for the administration to finally put a moratorium back on there? It was talked about, it was written about, it was, I mean, they, red flags, sirens, alarms, everything kept coming up, and yet, there was no action. There were complete blocks, ethnic communities, that removed all of their signs. We allowed that to happen. And Chairman, um, Commissioner, you allowed that to happen. We collectively allowed that to happen. We didn't push back enough against this administration. Businesses were put out of business. Communities were targeted. Ethnicities were targeted. And we sat by on the sidelines and watched it happen for years. So when you say we have to listen more, that's a perfect example of they were heard and no action. Let's use another example when it comes to ethnicities. We know the Department of Health and the regulations that they impose, and we'll just use Sushi restaurants, for example, and the enforcement of Department of Health that requires them to use gloves when handling food. Well, if you've ever been to a sushi restaurant, you'll know that the chefs don't use gloves. It's how they interact with the food. Where's the ethnic common sense on the approach of how food is prepared without a glove, and yet they're targeted. And I'll let you answer on either one and then I can continue the conversation. Well, I, I, Thank I mean, you for smiling, Commissioner. You, you, you know, I, um, uh, uh, I am smiling only because uh, we've had a number of conversations about the signage um, regulations and our uh, response to that. I, I would respectfully disagree that we just sat back and let it happen. I think you know, from the very first time you called me about the business in city on City Island, um, you know, I, you know, went to our deputy mayor um, and we moved as quickly as possible. Um, I would say that, you know, we have, um, uh, and we actually participated in a number of town halls uh, that uh, Councilmember Menchaca had, uh, Councilmember Espinot, and, you know, in his district, there, there was a lot of businesses that were targeted there. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we came to a resolution that I thought um, would be helpful to small businesses. I was, I would say I was disappointed um, that uh, we did not, uh, and the Department of Buildings was willing to open up the amount of uh, businesses that could now hang signs because one of the challenges was the cost of actually installing a sign. Um, and we were um, open to uh, allowing other businesses um, other types of in, uh, installing businesses uh, to hang signs, and that was not included um, in the, the new legislation. Um, but I would say that you know part of the the, the fee schedule um, that uh, businesses had to face was that fee was determined by council. Um, so you know we tried to work together, and I think at the end of the day we came to um, a, a, a solution that was. 
um, helpful for those small businesses. Uh, but what you what you're describing, I think, um, is um, for us a lesson in terms of how quickly information can be disseminated within the immigrant community, uh, and if we are not and if we are not aware of how to actually uh, in, uh, connect with immigrant uh, communities. Uh, then these things will happen. The reason why signs were torn down even before uh, we build the Department of Buildings even came out was because people had a, a method to communicate rapidly and, and one person was affected and the entire immigrant community knew that one person and therefore they proactively tore down their signs. Now, if we were and if we had a partnership with those organizations that we do now, we would have been able to say, you know, do not do anything with your sign. We are working on a solution and a fix. Um, so I think that is a good lesson for us uh, in terms of um, being able to uh, figure out how to rapidly get information out to immigrant groups. Um, but I would, you know, I would, I would push back on you and say that we did not sit back and just let businesses go out of business. Um, we worked aggressively with council uh, to fix this problem. And Commissioner, just thank you. Not, I, you know, I just want to respond to one question that you brought up. It was, it was great, and, I'm, and now I get to smile. They had a reason. It was called 5,000 reasons. That was the cost of the violation to begin with. And it went as high as 20,000. But that, Councilman, I, I just want to remind you that that fee schedule is set by council. Very, I'm glad that you brought that up, too, because it was this administration that removed the um, the previous administration's hold on enforcement. This administration started enforcing that law and that regulation, although it was outdated, while the previous right. administrations did not, knowing that there was a real problem and it was widespread. Right. And the government Bill. allowed it to happen. It happened for decades. And then when they decided it was convenient that, hey, as was well put, here's an opportunity to bring in additional revenue on the backs of small business, that's when this administration went all out and issued fines at alarming rates. At, so, Council Member, just, just to remind you, that what was being inspected was the safety and security of the signs as they were installed. If you remember, there was, in, there was a sign that collapsed on two or three uh, ladies in Bay Ridge um, and critically hurting one, right? So, so these inspections were generated by 311 complaints. Uh, they, were, uh, they were a safety inspection. Um, so I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm, I, what I'm, what, let, let's talk about what we learned from this, right? Because this is not about, you know, for sure this is not the administration saying let's figure out how to make money. Uh, this was uh, the Department of Buildings had a backlog of 3-1 complaints that were related to safety, um, and they had to figure out a way to actually uh, reduce that backlog. When we recognize that these three woman complaints may not have been related to safety, but may have been related uh, to business development, um, we then worked with council to figure out a way that we could help our small businesses. But the lessons learned from that was that there was a moment and a time period where the immigrant community figured out a way to connect and communicate with each other um, through channels that we were not aware of. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that going forward that if there's anything else, uh, whether it is a disaster or, or something that's happened, that we are, can effectively communicate to those communities to make sure that they have the proper information. Um, so that is, the, that, that is, I think, um, the goal for us at SPS, uh, because you heard it here. Uh, they are, they are in, individuals who are out there, who are running their business, uh, who they do not look at government as being helpful, uh, they do not know about any of our services, um, and that is a shame. And we need to do, and, and in a partnership, uh, we need to do more uh, to make sure that this gentleman that was sitting right here um, and, and his peers know that the City of New York Small Business Services has services that's available to them um, and services that they can actually help their business grow. Thank you, Commissioner. And I just want to respond one more time. 
Public safety is of the utmost importance. And the inspections that should have been made and could have been made didn't require $5,000 fines. If there was a question about endangerment of public safety, it could have been addressed. They, all of those inspections yielded at a minimum 5000 to start with. That's where you and I don't see eye to eye. So when we talk about how do we communicate, this administration communicates with a pink ticket that says pay. That's why there's no trust. That's why there's no relationship. That's why they don't interact with government agencies because there's only been one way. It's been either the hammer or the scissor. And that has been historic, and that is before your time, that is before my time, and I'm sure it'll be continued. And, I, and I'm passionate about this, and I, you know it's not directed toward you because I'm very fond of you. You know um, I'm passionate about this too. I and, and, and I would say that, that if you talk to small business owners, the overall, when, and I've talked to a lot of small business owners, they will agree um, that in the previous administration, uh, there was the feeling that government was using uh, fines as a way to raise revenue. And they have noticed a noticeable difference in terms of the way city agencies deal with, the, with uh, small businesses now. Now, saying that, mm. I know there's a small business owner right now that probably is being inspected by the health department and will receive a fine. So that small business owner will not understand what I just said. Uh, but our job is, and we have a number of resources where we now have compliance advisors. We go out ahead of inspections. Uh, we help businesses um, be prepared. We've helped save businesses almost $22 million in fines. Uh, we've reduced the amount of fines um, for small businesses by $40 million or even more. Um, so there is a, that we are making progress. Um, so again, I'm passionate, you're passionate. We all wanna see our small businesses succeed, especially our immigrant uh, small businesses. Um, and I think the work that we're doing and the work that we can do together uh, will help us get there. The small businesses that exist, I, have n I haven't received a single notice that, you know, Chairman, this administration has stopped fining us in one form or another. They complain that they're over-fined, over-regulated, must comply with outdated laws that are not in their language, easy to follow, or transparent. Are you familiar with the uh, Small Business Bill of Rights? Well, actually, I'm gonna point out something even that hits home. Uh, one of the earlier panelists mentioned open up a center. Mm -hmm. And see if these things sound familiar. There were, uh, in particular, five bullet points. One, that the center would be providing seminars, mm -hmm. civic engagement, education about regulations, business training, and building capacity. Aren't those the things that SBS typically does? Yes, and and so. Uh, Yama, who the organization, uh, we have been working with them to basically, this is what I was talking about, where there are community organizations that are well connected with immigrant communities, but they may not be aware of the services that the city has to offer, uh, whether it's SBS services, uh, whether it's Moya services, uh, even the Department of Buildings, uh, they have services for small businesses. Uh, so it's important that we work closely with these partners, we educate these partners on what's available, um, and I think uh, it's a healthy conversation that if we have services, uh, so for example, with our immigrant uh, guide, uh, we had difficulties with printing um, in Arabic. Uh, so once we hear those things, then we can make adjustments. Uh, but these organizations are doing great work in their communities. It doesn't make sense for us to replicate those uh, services, uh, but we can certainly help train them on how to make the connection uh, between their community and our services. So Commissioner, the earlier question I brought up the issue about uh, sushi restaurants and how they prepare food without gloves. What are we prepared to do when the Department of Health insists that anyone that prepares food use gloves? So, I mean, that's a conversation that I would have to have with the, the Commissioner of the Department of Health. Uh, as you know, 
Uh, they're responsible for making sure that our food consumption, it's, it's, it, that our food is safe uh, to consume. Uh, I'm not in a position right now to make a judgment on whether or not uh, sushi prepared by gloves or by the, your bare hands. Um, all I will say is that if you know, um, I can bring this to, I, I know in previous, test, uh, in t previous hearings, Council Member Peter Koo was talking about Department of Health in kimchi and whether or not they were culturally sensitive to the temperature that kimchi needs. Every, every culture has some unique way of preparing food that may not be aligned with the standards that the city set uh, to make sure that, the, that, in, in, that New Yorkers are safe when they consume food. Um, and I'm sure, and I have a great relationship with the Commissioner of the Department of Health, I'm sure that if we talk about this, then we could figure out a way um, to address that. Um, but I cannot say whether or not that, that, that is something that they will allow or, or not allow. I can't help but a part of me feels um, afraid of, because we brought this up on record, how many inspectors may go out there and now target sushi restaurants, and if that becomes the next issue, and anyone that may be listening to our hearings that works in that type of environment right. I, is you now know, saying, I, how, do we, how, no, do I, we, how do we prevent overzealous uh, targeting now um, and maybe bringing it out and talking about it in, in this type of a format is the best way for us to actually understand there are real problems out there and avoidable problems. And it's about sitting down because each one of those panelists also brought up, we're never at the table when rules and regulations are being drafted. We're at the tail end when they're being enforced. And had we been at the table, perhaps I could have shared with you ethically uh, sensitive issues like food prep and uh, temperature before it became law and enacted. And, and that's what this communication is all about. They're crying. They're saying, hey, make me a part of the conversation. Let me share with you how it impacts me. Let me share you what this actually does to my business model. Because on paper, it may look good. When you read it, it sounds good. But in a real world, there's unintended consequences. Um, the result of, and you also have a small business bill of rights. And one of those, uh, and maybe we should just go down them really quickly. They list, um, business owners in New York City have the right to courteous and professional treatment, inspectors who are polite, information about how long inspections will take and cost as related fees, knowledgeable inspectors who enforce agency rules uniformly, receive information about agency rules from inspectors or employees, contest a violation through a hearing, request a view of inspection, receive explanation from inspectors if requested, and that question if requested is the one that bothers me most, why shouldn't they get an explanation to begin with. Um, access information in languages other than English. Mm -hmm. The key word there again is access. And then lastly, um, comment anonymously and without fear of retribution on the performances or conduct of New York City employees. These are all of the issues that these small businesses have been complaining and especially uh, were brought out by the previous panel. As a result of the Immigrant Business Initiative uh, was a report, Building Your Business in New York City, a guide for immigrant entrepreneur, which is available in eight languages, English, Arabic, Bengali, Chinese, Haitian, Creole, Korean, Russian, and Spanish. The report is not released in Polish or Urdu. Two of the 10 languages, SBS is required to provide services in accordance with Local Law 30 of 2017. Were any Polish or Urdu speaking organizations consulted in producing this report? If yes, 
Why was the report then not produced in those languages? If no, why not? Are there any business owners in the city who primarily speak these languages? So, so absolutely, and, and the, the guide was released, uh, I believe, sometime last year or earlier um, last year. Um, so we are continuously, because one of the things, and I think you heard it from one of the panels, um, is that when you are translating, and we try to make the guide, guide as plain English as possible, uh, but there are some terms that do not translate well, and we want to make sure that we're not releasing a guide in a language um, that is not properly translated. So uh, we still have um, the final uh, two uh, that we need to translate. Um, but again, everything that we do, so for example, um, we have a guide for small businesses uh, to understand their responsibilities for the, the American Disabilities Act. Uh, so we start with uh, the highest concentration of uh, immigrant entrepreneurs, um, immigrant businesses in particular areas. So we'll start uh, with those languages and then we release those, the, the rest of the languages uh, according to our schedule. Uh, so we will continue to release um, the guides um, this fiscal year um, and we will have the rest of the guides uh, published by then. And I apologize that I didn't let Moya um because I just enjoy our conversation, Commissioner. <laughs> and I'm sure she um, uh, enjoyed our dialogue. It was most constructive. Um, did you want to so. add anything to this, Moya? Um, no, I think we um, can look forward to continuing to work with SBS on the translation of their materials. They really provide important information uh, to immigrant communities um, and sort of stand ready to support as needed on um, interpretation of, of the report and other materials. So translation, you're glad I did that round with the commissioner, not you. Got it. <laughs> Look, I, we know the needs out there. Yes. And I don't think we should, we don't have to re reinvent the wheel here. We can really make significant changes today. And that's why this joint hearing was so important to um, myself and the chair, um, because there's impacts that are currently undermining our small businesses that are government created. It's not enough that they're struggling to survive through e-commerce, consumer behavior changes, uh, big box store competition, and they're surviving. Now you have government regulation, a, and I'll say it, a partner that is not really a partner, uh, that has been labeled and perceived as the enemy more than um, a willing, capable partner to help navigate. And we've had this debate so many times about whether there are 5,300 or 6,000 rules and regulations that small businesses have to comply with, and we know not all small businesses have to comply with all 6,000. But yet, I can't, and I'm, I think I, I'm read, I read well, I, I can articulate. I can't make heads or tails of this. I've got attorneys that can't make heads or tails of this. Interpretation varies from inspector to inspector, from agency to department. So how is an immigrant community, one that may not speak English at all, going to comply if council members can't understand these rules and regulations, if departments aren't able to, or agencies, I'm going to reiterate that this is an opportunity for us to do something, not just say something. We're great at acknowledging how important our immigrant communities are and these small businesses are and the contributions they make to our great city. But yet we undermine their very existence each and every day. We hurt them more than we help them and not only hurt them, I've mentioned this in the past also, there is a slew of regulations on notices that must be posted in every workplace. There, those regulations, you'd need a wall that's 10 feet wide by 10 feet high to comply with. Yes, why aren't we using technology? Why aren't those notices being uh, being provided electronically. 
where we have an option on the language also, the translation, so perhaps the employer can read them, the employee can read them, and anyone else that's walking by can read them in any language or on any issue. And I don't think I'm, I've said something that surprised any of you. We know this. We're not doing anything about it. We penalize those very businesses. Today, there's a business in New York City that's re receiving a fine for inadequate notices, ones that have been changed or outdated that they're not aware of, or a, a notice that they're now required a specific font or language that they're not aware of. It's happening as we speak, and we're doing nothing about them, about it. We're allowing those small businesses to be hurt. We're allowing them to learn the hard way, and that is through fines. Any comment? I, I would disagree that we're allowing that to happen. I think, uh, you know, um, as you were talking, the, the, the first thing that popped into my mind is how do I get to that business before they get inspected, and how do I get that business to understand that they can actually come to SBS, we can send a compliance advisor out, and we can actually educate that business owner on what they need to be in compliance with. Uh, I can't speak to the Department of Labor, um, you know, in, in terms of requirements uh, for all the employment notices that need to be up, but what I can say and what I would you know, ask you and everyone else to help me with is figure out different ways we can get to not only our entrepreneurs, but our immigrant entrepreneurs. Uh, because I agree with you, immigrant entrepreneurs face an additional, especially non-English uh, speaking immigrant entrepreneurs, face an additional barrier in terms of uh, understanding the regulatory environment of the city of New York. Uh, so we need to be more proactive uh, than ever uh, to reach those immigrant entrepreneurs uh, before uh, they are inspected. Um, so awareness of our services, and you know this, and I've said it a number of times, is one of our biggest challenge. Uh, we've beefed up our presence, uh, our online presence, our partnerships, uh, but we have more work to do. Um, and if there's any other organizations that we can figure out how to train to understand our services, I think the better we will be as, a, or as an agency uh, to deploy our resources uh, before a small business actually um, gets inspected by any agency. I want to thank you both, Chairman. I know that we're running short on time, and um, the Commissioner and Moya have um, said they'd be available to 3 o'clock. I'm going to ask my colleague that we work on this with SBS to make sure that we come up with a law that will allow these postings at a minimum to be done electronically, mm -hmm. at least for the city requirements. Mm -hmm. And I also want to acknowledge that we're at fault here because a lot of these laws are being passed through the city council. Yep. And the agencies and the inspectors are just enforcing laws that the city council right. is passing. So we're part of the problem, not the solution. Uh, I will take that and say, yeah, you're right. Um, I think Repeat that, that please. I just, I just want to make sure. Well, I, I think we're making during, some progress. During prep, this happened during prep. Where he's like, can you speak into the mic uh, and say that, yes, it's true. And, and we're often not on the same side on issues in terms of uh, regulations, and, and I recognize that as well. Um, but on the council side, we need to take responsibility for for the engagement component and allow for immigrants to be part of the discussion. And I think the awnings, the awnings saga in every borough, and you were, in, you were up in the Bronx and I was in Brooklyn, and we were having discussions, and so we, I think, all learned from that. And what I, what I want to just give as, as a final thought, uh, and, and really as an invitation that, the, that Chair Joe and I also gave, was to return to the table. There's a lot of other questions about your financing, how that works. Yes. Um, and and your, your testimony kind of points to it. But I know we're out of time, so let's just commit to getting back into a room and really thinking through this. Yep. So many of the immigrant communities that continue to survive, despite everything that we just spoke about, they continue to survive and thrive. And imagine if so many of these barriers are gone and how, how high they could fly in terms of their vision for their, uh, their kind of entrepreneurial ideas in our immigrant communities that continue to grow. Immigrants continue to come to the city of New York. And so for us, I think we, we need to really commit to that. 
uh, because the work that we can do with small businesses allows us to have even more opportunities to bring all the non-business information around public charge, around IDNYC, around all the other services that we have that are uh, often without any barrier to their financial, their free services, um, but are not getting to them as well. So there's, there's, a, there's a big problem, and I know you're committed, and I want to thank you for the work that you do every day. And, and we'll, we'll make it happen. We'll make it happen. Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I just want to let you, you know, uh, it is personal. Um, you know, uh, for many immigrants, entrepreneurship is not a luxury. It's a necessity. Um, and especially coming into this year where we're talking about the census, um, I would love to reconnect with you because uh, I think, um, you know, there's an opportunity for us not only to figure out um, ways to connect to immigrant entrepreneurs, but also to un help them understand why it's important for them to uh, spread the word in their community that they need to be counted as well. Um, and immigrant-owned business owners are, are part of that solution. Um, so happy to follow up with you on a number of these uh, issues. Beautiful. Thank you. So right. we'll get you out of here. Thank you very much. And, uh, thank you. All right. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the holidays. And uh, if anyone else is here to testify, please fill out a slip. We are, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna call, call you up. We also must recognize council members Rosenthal, Rodriguez, and Moya, uh, Francisco Moya from Queens, uh, who are here today. And next we have Saruf Sial from NYC Now. Wait, it's N NYC, well, actually. It's Nick Knock. <laughs> Nick Knock, yeah, oh yeah. my goodness. Yeah. I knew that. Okay, yeah. there you go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. I'll, I'll explain in a bit. <laughs> is there anybody else here that's gonna testify? And I just wanna make sure that Moya and SBS leave representatives here uh, to, uh, to hear the rest of the testimony. Yeah, I will be. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. May I begin. Just make sure that the light is on, sure. and you're, it's close to you, close to you. Okay. You may begin. So, Thank you. All right. Great. Uh, so, good afternoon, Councilmember Manchaka, um, and other members of the Committee on uh, Small Business and Immigration. Thank you so much for this opportunity to testify. My name is Sadaf. I'm with Nick Knock or the New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives. That's what it stands for. Um, I have the honor and privilege every day to work with worker-owned and controlled businesses across the city, the overwhelming majority of which are owned and controlled by immigrants, by uh, immigrant women, by people of color across the five boroughs. Um, and I, I appreciate all the issues that were brought up and talked about today because as small businesses, as immigrant-owned businesses, worker co-ops face a lot of those same challenges. Um, but I'm also here to highlight that worker co-ops themselves are a tool and a solution for immigrant communities um, to really build sustainable and dignified jobs with living wages, to provide access to business ownership for communities um, that are often, oftentimes face barriers to business ownership to begin with, um, and to just improve uh, the quality of life for workers and generate wealth in communities. Um, a lot of the worker co-ops that uh, immigrants have begun across the city are really paving the way in certain industries. I just wanted to highlight some examples of that to show the broader impacts that worker co-ops can have. Um, one example, and I know Council Member Menchaca, you've worked a lot with um, the occupational health and safety training. Um, and so we do have a number of co-ops that I know you're familiar with and have met with in, in that industry. And we know it's an industry where there's fraud and at the same time is critical to, to providing information on workers' rights um, and safety uh, in the workplace. Um, and so these worker co-ops in this industry are improving standards for curriculum, for facilitation, while um, ensuring that the workers, the worker owners, um, are being paid well. 
and their wages, uh, not just in terms of their salary, but also in terms of equity, um, are higher than, than other businesses. And that is because the model itself is a model where workers define for themselves what their wages should be, they share profits. Um, but there's that broader effect to, com to their consumers who are immigrant workers seeking this uh, information um, in terms of the quality of information, but also in terms of the pricing. So uh, immigrant workers are able to access these, uh, these trainings for half the cost of other private uh, OSHA training institutions. So that's one example. We, uh, a lot was mentioned here on language access, so I also wanted to lift that up, that we have a co-op that has uh, really high standards in the industry of um, interpretation and translation services, Caracol, um, that has even opened the eyes of social justice practitioners to what it means to provide quali quality interpretation and translation um, for communities at, while paying workers well to do that kind of work. Um, so um, that said, I wanted to lift up the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, which I know both of you have supported. Um, uh, we hope that uh the you know, support for that continues and increases into FY21. Um, so you can expect me to be back here <laughs> next year, if not me, other, uh, other people from the worker co-op community. Um, but thank you for your support on that. That initiative has been really critical in elevating this model, getting co-op education out there. And we hope that it can be enhanced and continue because there is uh, a growing number of co-ops now on the one hand, and also on the other, a growing number of demand from CBOs, worker centers, labor unions for this kind of work. Um, and um, and uh, also to highlight a couple of other issues briefly, and then I'll end so you can all get back to your day. But um, in addition to things like um, you know access to capital, which also affects co-ops, um, I would say that um, the, you know the city could look into making procurement opportunities more accessible to worker co-ops, uh, especially because what they kind of are. Opportunities? What procurement, kind? contracting um, for goods and services that the city needs, especially because these are values-driven democratic businesses that have more than just a one bottom line impact. Um, and um, part of that could be making the MWBE certification more accessible to worker co-ops as well as other immigrant-owned small businesses in general. Um, there's current MWBE requirements that are um, that prevent like immigrant owned businesses from being considered minorities or women owned. Um, and so really taking a look at that. Um, also space for worker co-ops has come up as a big issue. Um, and that's one because we've had a growing number, uh, like worker cooperatives are growing now uh, in size. Uh, they are becoming more independent from their nonprofit incubators. And as that's happening, the need for space has increased. But just generally speaking, our membership is affected by displacement, gentrification um, as members of communities facing this generally as tenants and as business owners, um, and so we're also in support of initiatives that, um, such as the legislation around the commercial rent stabilization, as well as funding for the community land trusts, um, and, and we hope to be in more communication around potential like space for worker cooperatives as, um, as important models for businesses, for communities. Um, so yeah, thank you for the, this opportunity to testify. Please consider us a resource on worker co-ops um, should you have further information or need further information on that. Um, but uh, I will just conclude by saying that you know, co-ops are not just a model for economic advancement for immigrant communities, but they are also about um, creating real opportunity for economic democracy. Um, and creating shared prosperity. Um, so because of that, it's really a unique model that's about building a better New York for all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have some questions yeah. that yeah. I think really connect to the, 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 a few themes that this committee uh, has had over time. And the great thing about this joint committee is that the focus with small businesses have, have um, it just don't always come up. 
and you are at the, at the, at the kind of crux of that with co-op worker cooperatives and the immigrant community. And where I find it also very interesting is the kind of access to capital piece. You mentioned that that's an issue. And SBS in their testimony speak about over $31 million portfolio that really connects to organizations that bring in low interest rate loans. How, how do you, Nick Knock specifically, but really the cooperatives that you help grow, connect to the SBS program for capital access? And which program is this in particular through SBS? Well, it, I mean, maybe that's just like a telling answer a question. Like, you probably don't even know that SBS has a loan program that with low interest rates mm -hmm. for businesses. And, but they tout that as a program that is valuable to New Yorkers with 2,000 some recipients totaling up to $31 million. Mm -hmm. So right there, there's a, there's a lack of, of interest. How do you utilize SBS right now in terms of, because you, you, your contract comes actually through SBS. Right, exactly. Right? So you, you interact with uh, the contracting part because of all the city funding that kind of goes through the coalition. Right. Is it, is it more than that? And, and where does SBS support you and the creation of these uh, worker cooperatives. Thank you for these questions. Yeah, uh, so just to speak to access to capital generally for worker co-ops, the main er place that they go is co-op lenders because they understand co-ops. Those lenders are few and far between and are often challenged as well to lend to just any worker co-ops. Um, you know, because a lot are startups or a lot face challenges similar to any traditional business in terms of accessing loans. But then with worker co-ops, you have in addition to that challenges of trying of understanding the co-op model. So when they go to traditional lenders, they are not familiar with how co-ops operate, how they work. Um, there's oftentimes more require more paperwork requirements because you're dealing with model, a model of, that's based on multiple ownership. Um, and so um, and so there's those additional kind of uh, barriers that worker co-ops have to accessing loans um, in addition to just being regular small businesses or immigrant-owned small businesses um, and those traditional issues. In terms of the SBS programs, um, uh, as far as I know, no worker co-ops have, have accessed any of those, and I, I do believe that more could be done around spreading information that about the availability of those programs um, and how to access um, how to access them. And we would definitely want to work closely with SBS to ensure that um, that the worker co-op model is understood within that, and, and it, it could actually be an easier process for worker co-ops than normally this kind of thing is, because we're dealing with a model that's multi-ownership. Um, we have worked over the last six years through WCBDI with SBS. Um, we've been, you know, I'd say a lot of the work has been focused around that initiative, which uh, works with over a dozen nonprofits um, directly, um, and, um, to provide this kind of information. Uh, we've made, I think, really great headway uh, working together um, to, to get information out there about this model. Uh, I think certainly a lot, there could definitely be more that can be done to, to get information out regarding worker co-ops, to making worker co-ops more part of the um, the work of the agency as well and, and what it does. Um, and so uh, there's definitely a, a need for ongoing conversation and communication there, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more, and I, and I think the, the fact that the city council has really focused its investment in the worker cooperative movement is one thing, but I think the real goal he here is to embed it into the city's infrastructure, like you said, and make it part of their, one of their top three things that they do out of SBS is to really grow worker cooperatives. And, and I'm not sure that that's the, the goal right now. And, but that can change, and that can change through discussion. And my last question, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Chair Jonai uh, for, for questions, is the ultimate work that, that you do on the ground is to empower immigrants. And right now, we have a, a really tough moment in our history. At the federal level, we see what's happening. 
Um, at the ground, though, do you feel like SBS and the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs has, have assisted you in any recent requests that you have made of the city to support your constituency and the, the, all the, like, tell me a little bit about that relationship and if it's there, if it exists, if it doesn't, and what needs you might have that might bring them to you for support. Right. Um, so, yeah, I we have certainly, with the MWBE uh, issues, we have brought them up with SBS and had, held conversation. They've been very open to listening um, to those concerns and investigating those concerns. So I think they're, they're, that's like an initial stages. Um, you know, as immigrant worker owners, there's a variety of needs and issues that have come up that we're trying to address internally with our membership um, and trying to get out information about Know Your Rights um, to worker owners as well. Uh, there has been on some level of, uh, a, you know, like a fear of p potential like targeting around on worker co-ops, um, you know, given that it's a model that serves immigrant communities. Um, but none of nothing uh, that I know that has happened regarding that um, to my knowledge. But um, we're, we're just working to make sure that immigrant communities know that this is a model that exists um, to provide them that economic stability. Um, and uh, that's even more critical in this moment in time. Um, um, so, uh, so far, I would say that, you know, there's, there has been listening and responsiveness to the issues that we have brought up. Um, but I do think that immigrant communities, and this was mentioned early, <clears throat> earlier today, but there's that fear of government and turning to government for certain concerns that um, the immigrant community has. Um, and so we've been just working internally to ensure that, like, there's uh, solid leadership within the worker co-op movement to respond to any of those concerns as it comes up and building that leadership internally. Thank you for that. To be continued. Yeah. Chair Jonai. Thank you, Chair. We've spoken yes. uh, a number of times and I'm just grateful for what you're doing when it comes to the cooperative um, initiative. And Chair, we can't help small businesses in the their businesses meaning to grow but we can help them in other ways and cooperatives will allow these small businesses to buy products and services collectively and benefiting from bulk purchase discount I encourage this uh, whether it be by industry or by immigrant group or um, in any fashion possible that is a model that we're supposed to figure out how to be supportive of because when those cooperatives do well, each of those small businesses will do better. We can't give you business, we can't steer business towards you, but at least we can help you buy your products and services collectively and benefiting from it, where if your bottom line is healthier, New York City is healthier, so thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you for coming today. Thanks so much. And I think that is it. I, um, do you have any final thoughts? We have a lot of work to do. do we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, and, and what a beautiful community to do it with, like our immigrant community, as diverse as it is, uh, it's really a testament to the backbone that it actually is to our, to our neighborhoods and the economy. And that's why we're here. So let's, upward and onward, this, Hearing is now over. <laughs>